sometimes people say, you know, they see certain stocks going up, Tesla, Meta, whatever, right? Having tremendous years, Palantir. And they think like, there's no opportunities out there now. All these stocks have gone up so much. It's always opportunities in the market. It's just different opportunities. I can tell you this, the stocks I was buying nine months ago are not the same stocks I'm buying right now. The stocks I'm going to be buying nine months from now are not going to be the stocks, same stocks I'm buying right now. The market changes. It gives you different opportunities. And this is why I always preach my, my strategy, growth, value, dividends. I call it GVD. It's my strategy. It's growth stocks, value stocks, dividend stocks in your portfolio. I have several of each category because you're going to get different pitches at different times. Certain times, growth stocks are going to be extremely overvalued. There's going to be no deals anywhere, and it's going to seem like you're in a market bubble. And you're like, eh. So then where do you go to? What are some of the brand new stocks you've been investing in recently and which ones of them are you most optimistic about or most excited moving forward? I definitely see some opportunities out there and it's in a few different places. So a lot of growth stocks have been running. So not to say there's no opportunity in growth stocks. There are a few and we could probably talk about those, but um, I definitely see there being more opportunities in dividend and value stocks in the back half of this year, mainly because those stocks have been kind of forgotten they haven't been the, the exciting play because obviously a lot of those stocks don't attract the growth investors. And a lot of those stocks have been forgotten because treasuries have been yielding so much and savings accounts have been getting so much. So people are like, who cares about making a 4%, 5% dividend yield when I can make 4%, 5% in a savings account or a treasury? My belief is you won't be able to get 5% plus on treasuries and 4% plus on savings accounts forever. If I had to guess, um, rates will ultimately be much lower in a year or two years from now than they are today. And when that happens, there's obviously going to have to be a return to a lot of these dividend type stocks. So I see there being a lot of opportunities out there. The next opportunity I see is for actually hedging portfolios. And this is a more complicated subject. I know not everybody's, you know, uh, into hedging, but it's definitely worthwhile exploring a little bit about hedge, how to hedge a portfolio. And I, I, I put together a great like 45 minute long video inside the private group maybe a month ago on just all these different hedging opportunities because a lot of people are just, you're not hedged in the market. And what happens if a crash happens? What happens if, you know, the SP 500 goes down 20%, 30%? You say, well, I can buy for cheaper. Yes, 100%. And that's great. But there's also, if you had hedged your portfolio, you probably would have been able to make some incredible gains. Then you could have flipped out of that and then piled that in to your long positions at very low prices if you've got a hedged portfolio. So I think there's some real hedging opportunities in the back half this year, especially if the market continues to run, just for protection, just in case, just in case things go bad in 2024. I see a stock like PayPal. PayPal's a steel deal in my opinion. PayPal is probably the, the easiest money I've seen since Meta last year, when Meta was just disgustingly undervalued in Q4 of uh, 2022. And PayPal is just trading at a valuation right now. That I'm just laughing at because this is a growth company, but trading at a P, a 4P of like 12. Whenever they get announced a new CEO, I think there's probably going to be a pretty big stock price move in regards to that one because then there, there'll be clarity around the CEO, CFO simultaneously and kind of what their vision is, what where they're going in the future. And so I think that's a great opportunity in the market. Um, yeah, so those are just some of the some of the opportunities I see out there in the market. But there's always opportunities in the market. You know, I think sometimes people say, you know, they see certain stocks going up, Tesla, Meta, whatever, right? Having tremendous years, Palantir. And they think like, there's no opportunities out there now. All these stocks have gone up so much. It's always opportunities in the market. It's just different opportunities. I can tell you this, the stocks I was buying nine months ago are not the same stocks I'm buying right now. The stocks I'm going to be buying nine months from now are not going to be the stocks, same stocks I'm buying right now. The market changes. It gives you different opportunities. And this is why I always preach my, my strategy, growth, value, dividends. I call it GVD. It's my strategy. It's growth stocks, value stocks, dividend stocks in your portfolio. I have several of each category because you're going to get different pitches at different times. Certain times, growth stocks are going to be extremely overvalued. There's going to be no deals anywhere and it's going to seem like you're in a market bubble. And you're like, eh. so then where do you go to? Well, there's a few places you can go to. One is hedging. So if there is some big downside and that is a bubble you're in, you're going to be able to make a ton of money coming off of that, right? Second place is maybe dividend and value stocks or the flavor of the month because everybody wants to pile into growth stocks. So you see opportunities there. There's going to be other times when you're in a very risk off market, like we were in 2022, especially the back half of 2022, where no one wants any piece of mega cap tech of, of growth stocks. People just, they don't care what price you give them it at. They don't want it, right? In certain times, that, that's where you need to be plowing that money in, right? 
And so, um, yeah, so bottom line is there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there. There's going to continue to be opportunities. They're just going to be different opportunities. And that's whereas you as a more experienced investor over time can identify those opportunities and figure out this is where I need to go next. This is where I need to go next. Every single week I'm buying out there. And I'm also buying hedges in the market. So just in case, you know, the big recession comes that they've been talking about, just in case it comes in 2024, I'm hedging up just in case. So I can make a lot of money from that if that even transpires. So, mm, Okay. And you mentioned a few stocks you have been buying and you're very excited for PayPal, for example. Are there any which you haven't actually fired the trigger on yet, but you're you know, really excited. Maybe you've had that sort of fizzle moment you get when you, you start looking at a stock and get really excited and, and do the deep dive. Yeah, there's 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 a few that I am um I, I've started some positions and I I'm, I'm gonna probably build out actually some hated stocks that people don't like right now, like Target, Disney. Yeah, you might not know about that over in the States, man. Everybody's in a in a fit all the time. But at the end of the day, people cancel these stocks and then no one remembers it six months from now, three months from now, three weeks from now, because somebody does something more dumb and then everybody's mad at them and then everybody's mad at the next one. So, um, yeah, there's definitely some, some uh, I've kind of been buying why they just crashed because I'm like, OK, y'all can sell these stocks. I'll, I'll take these shares off your hands. I've been working on AMD for a while now, and obviously the clock, the, the stock has climbed tremendously, but I'm, I'm really trying to see what AMD really has going. I'm trying to look on the tech side. Are they actually going to be a serious competitive threat to NVIDIA in terms of the AI race? Because those AI chips are selling for like, I mean, from what I've heard, 20, 30,000 plus dollars per AI chip. It's incredible. And so doing a little digging there. And then um, I'm just, I just in a really good spot in the market right now. I got to say that, you know, in terms of my portfolios, on the long side, I'm just looking really, really good. I love the way my companies are starting to execute, and I can't wait for the next several quarters. This is like probably the most excited I've been for my company's earnings over this next, I say, two to three quarters. So really happy there. Really happy with my hedging, where I'm positioned in the market, and I'm just I'm not I'm not scared at all. If there's a crash, I'm gonna make so much from my hedges, so I'm not scared of a crash. If we have a kangaroo market that goes nowhere for a bit here, I'm fine with that because it'll give me more time to buy some of these stocks that I think are extremely discounted at great prices. And if the market continues to go up, then it's gonna be money printer time. So um, I'm just really really happy with where I'm at in the market right now. Tesla stock, it's way up a hundred percent year to date. Have you picked up any more Tesla stock this year? And would you consider buying at current levels? Yeah, I picked up some at the very beginning of this year. Uh, it was a brutal year for all of us Tesla shareholders to have to go through last year. It was uh, yeah, very, very brutal. But um, at the end of 2022 and sp specifically going into this year, the stock is just very undervalued. For anybody that has a longer term outlook on, on Tesla, very undervalued. So I actually bought some shares for the first time in a long time, as in like since like 2019. And so instead of just being a, a holder of the stock, I was a buyer. Now, for me personally, I'm not going to add any more Tesla shares here now that the stock's 250 plus. Not that I think it's not a good deal. You can still make probably a good amount of money over the next uh, few years in Tesla stock. Just for me personally, it's already a huge position for me. I already have, I believe it's over $400,000 in that stock. And so for me, that's a really good sized position. And I feel comfortable with kind of my level of risk. In regards to Tesla, I've had as much as around uh, probably close to a million dollars or maybe even over a million at one point in Tesla stock. And so for me, kind of in that 400000 to 500000 range feels about right. But yeah, you could say if I didn't own Tesla, would I be buying Tesla shares? The answer to that is probably. There's a lot of, of very appetizing deals out there in the market right now. But uh, yeah, Tesla is still... Uh, it's still undervalued. The Ford P, people look at the Ford P, they think, oh, it's got to be very overvalued. When you look at the growth rates that the company should command over this next several years, it's not nearly as overvalued as it might look at, on first surface when you look at a Ford P or something like that. So considering Tesla stock primarily from a stock point of view, from an investment point of view, what are the key metrics or things you're looking out for, whether it's top line growth or bottom line growth over the next few years? Yeah. Obviously, revenue is always going to be, you know, first and foremost when it comes to Tesla. You know, are they able to continue to put up, you know, very nice double digit growth as in like 25 percent numbers, 35 percent numbers in good times and hot years, maybe 45 percent numbers. We'll see what Cybertruck puts up. That should be uh, very impressive. Gross margin, extremely important in regards to Tesla. And obviously, in, re in regards to Tesla's margins, they've taken certainly a hit. 
over the past few quarters as a lowered price, right? And we really want to see margin stabilization. And then we want to see margins hopefully start trending back up, especially in the back half of this year and moving into future years. And then the bottom line is obviously very, very important for this company. At the end of the day, Tesla, from the masses, Tesla, look at look at Tesla as an auto manufacturer. And if you're an auto manufacturer, you've got to put up those extremely impressive net income numbers, those extremely impressive EPS numbers, because that gets everybody off your back in terms of like looking at it from just a valuation standpoint of your profitability, your P ratio, your forward P ratio and things like that. So those are three main metrics I'm looking at personally. I'm actually excited to see the growth in the energy business. I mean, the business has never really... It's never really what's been attracting attracting me to Tesla, but I've seen some of the business and some of their storage products and whatnot and some of the, these recent numbers that I'm absolutely blown away with. So that's a business line I'm actually very excited to see um, over this next one to two years and, and what happens there. Yeah, definitely. Energy growth has been, it's kind of gone parabolic. They've just launched their mega uh, factory in uh, California. They've got another one announced in China. What do you think the playbook could be there for the energy? Do you think they could just start banging out these factories all over the world like they've been doing gigafactories? It's a potential. The, the, the reason the energy business has never really gotten my interest as much is because that's a harder business for me to see how big the opportunity really is. And I would put it like this. I kind of almost feel like somebody would have felt if they were investing in Amazon stock back in, let's say 2008, 2010, 2012, before Amazon was really respected from AWS. Because back then, people really just looked at Amazon as this is this, this big e-commerce company, right? Kind of like most people look at Tesla right now, it's just this big auto company. And so for me, it's hard for me to say what they can scale to, what they can do revenues there. For me, I just look at it as a cherry on top. And it's this huge opportunity that I don't know how big it is. I don't know, you know, if this is a, you know, a $20 billion business down the road or 30 billion or 50 billion or hundred billion. And that's pretty exciting to me. I look at Tesla just on the auto business and I feel like the stock's undervalued. That energy business is, is the AWS in my opinion. Just it's a cherry on top that we'll see how big it go, how big it grows to, but um, and I'm very excited. When I consider investments, sometimes I think, you know, it's really good to simplify your thought process. And sometimes I simplify it into two things. One is the current growth rate. And then the second is how many years of growth. Now, when you think about Tesla from this point of view, is it kind of the holy grail of stocks? Because not only is there potentially a high growth rate, that high growth rate could be around for a decade two decades with the amount of other cool options they've got in the business. Um, how do you sort of think about that? Yeah. So I think about it a few ways for, for Tesla. I look out and I really try to view like the next three to five years. And although it's very fun to think about the next 10 years, the next 20 years with Tesla, it is hard to forecast. Right. And for a lot of us, Tesla shareholders, we've heard it for a million years. Now the, the competition's coming, the competition's coming. We've heard it for, as long, certainly as long as I've been a shareholder and even before that, and Jim Chano's going on CNBC and all these folks, right? The competition's coming. And the one thing I will say is it looks like the competition is finally trying to enter the market in a more serious way this year, next year. And we'll see if it's actually any competition. Um, so far, we haven't seen these other players really cause any sort of damage in, in regards to Tesla's business model. We're, we're still trying to see like what, what are all these other auto manufacturers doing? They're having a lot of problems trying to ramp EVs at all right now. And they're also having demand issues. That's the other problem. And that's what kind of is giving me confidence about do people really want EVs or do they just want a Tesla? Because I'm looking in Lucid, for an example, that is seen as they're supposed to have a really good product. I, they're having a lot of demand issues when it comes to Lucid. And you got to say, why is that, right? And so in regards to Tesla, it's, it's a very... It's very exciting story, but if you're trying to run projections on Tesla, you need to run it, I think, five different scenarios. You need to run a, a ultra bearish scenario. You need to run a bearish scenario, uh, your middle case. So this is like your base case, I call it. Uh, what you think, like if you had to put your life on a line, that's the case you think, right? You need to run a bull case and a, and a super bullish case, okay? And you need to run different revenue projections on what you think are realistic under those different scenarios in gross margins. And then what do you think is can be actually the bottom line? And I think you can do that for about the next five years, but the next 10 years, I think it's much more difficult because we know the landscape obviously changes over time. And 
Tesla right now has a huge advantage over the competition. Do they keep the pedal to the metal? I think so, but that's obviously not a, you know a, always a, a possible thing to predict. Maybe they lose their competitive edge at some point. I hope not. I think they got it, but we shall see. Do you think it's just going to be so much harder for competition to catch up than people think? And then are you optimistic for competition catching up in the next few years? Or do you think it maybe won't happen? Yeah, and, and so one of my thesis is always on Tesla was everything Tesla is doing is so far ahead of the competition. And this is going to be way harder for these folks to accomplish. They, they, you know, <clears throat> let's be honest. A lot of these auto manufacturers put off EVs as a serious thing until really the past few years. And all of a sudden you heard the, all these announcements over the past one to three years from all these auto manufacturers. Oh, we're going to spend $10 billion, $20 billion, <clears throat> $30 billion, $50 billion on EV. And I think they're all realizing this is a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. And no one ever gave Tesla the credit for that. And you can't just throw money at something and think it's going to magically work out. You need the right engineers. You need the right culture. You need the right team. You, you need the right vision from the top that gets everybody inspired to go after that, right? And also you're trying to beat a company that's already way ahead of you, which is a very tough thing to do. And so everybody's coming to that realization of like, dang, we should have been investing in this technology in a serious way. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when Tesla was. And when Tesla was being laughed at as this, this money furnace company that was burning all this money. And what are they doing over there? But this happens in business. I mean, you, you, you could say, why, why didn't Walmart become Amazon, right? I mean, Walmart, if we go back 20 years ago, Amazon, you know, 20 years ago, 2003, Amazon was a complete joke compared to Walmart. You couldn't even compare those companies. It was almost laughable, right? And yet here Amazon came. And they just ate Walmart's lunch. And now, you know, Amazon's a company that's substantially larger, probably 3x to 5x the market cap, I would guess today, than a company like Walmart, which 20 years ago, once again, it was a joke. And Walmart should have beat them. But Walmart didn't invest the way Amazon invested in the warehouses, the network, e-commerce, and take it serious. And then Walmart tried to enter the game way late. And look what they get for it, right? And so that's the problem with all these auto manufacturers. But for the auto manufacturers, it's a lot worse. For auto manufacturers, a lot worse than it is for Walmart. At the end of the day, a lot of people are still going to go into Walmart. Internal combustion engine demand is just going to continue to go down rapidly over this next five to 10 years. And that's a huge issue for these guys because they're trying to get this new technology. And that's why I've always said, people have asked me for years, oh, why not buy Ford stock? Why not buy GM? It's trading at a PE of five, four, six, whatever, right? Some disgusting. And at the end of the day, why would I want to take that risk even at a PE of five? When that company is being completely disrupted and they've got to change their technologies completely, they got to change the company culture, the way they do their business models, dealership networks, taking that out of the fold, supercharger networks, right? Which they're now trying to just, you know, cling on to Tesla for these supercharger networks. It, yeah, they're finding out, damn, we should have been, we should have taken this serious 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because we would have been a lot better spot. But now we're a little late to this game and we're finding out it's, it's harder than we thought. Yeah. And as you say, uh, the legacy auto was late to the game. They didn't get Tesla. They didn't get the EV revolution. Um, but also potentially some people that don't fully get it yet is institutional investors. There's still a relatively low level of institutional investment into Tesla. Do you think Wall Street gets Tesla yet? And if not, when will they? What's it going to take? I think Wall Street gets the auto business of Tesla. I think there's a few things Wall Street doesn't quite get yet. I think it's the energy business um, and trying to figure out what's the TAM there, what, what could that be. I think it's the autonomous taxi network opportunity, which honestly, in my opinion, Tesla shouldn't really get credit for that. You, you shouldn't get credit for a business you haven't even technically launched yet. So even in my opinion, I know some Tesla bulls will disagree with me on that. My, my, my opinion on that is don't give them credit for that yet, right? But they don't understand that opportunity, how big that opportunity is. And the other component I think Wall Street doesn't get yet, they will in a few years from now, but they don't yet, is a services opportunity. And they missed this when it came to Apple as well. Apple had this beautiful services business that you could tell was going to become, in my opinion, the second most important business for Apple only after the iPhone business. And sure enough, it became that, right? And so with Tesla, the services opportunity is massive. The supercharger network opportunity, finally, people are starting to wake up to this because of obviously the Ford and GM deal. Then you have Tesla auto insurance. You have uh, 
premium connectivity in the cars, right? Things are going to break on cars over time. Tesla's going to have that sort of opportunity, right? Once cars are out of warranty and you have more and more on the road, batteries are going to need to be replaced. There's a million different things. And so the services opportunity in Tesla is so massive and so many products that are going to be in that services category that we don't even see today that are going to come out over the next three years, seven years, you know, 10 years. And so I think there's a lot that they don't get yet around Tesla, but you, they're going to come around. They'll come around. And especially once the numbers start to hit. The only reason Tesla really had that huge ramp up in the stock price starting in 2019, going into 2020, 2020 2021, right, was because they put the numbers up. They, once Tesla keeps putting up these numbers, then it becomes undeniable. And Wall Street says, dang, you know what? We got to buy this baby. So.